Cascade Hills, how y'all doing today? That's good. Let's pray real quick. Dear Lord, we love you. We're grateful for you. It's an honor to be able to be in this room with this group of people right here, right now, whether they're here physically or they're watching online or on television. God, we ask and pray that you would speak with boldness and clarity into the hearts and lives of every single person that's here today. Lord, we, we need a touch from God. We need a word from God. We live in crazy times. And so, God, I pray that in, in this moment right now, you would speak to every person as if they were the only person that was in this room. I thank you in advance for what's going to be an incredible night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I'm glad you're here. It's going to be an incredible day. I'm super excited to be at Cascade Hills Church. What an honor. What a privilege. Uh, I have passed this church 80 million times on the way to Panama City, uh, coming from the north side of Atlanta in Ackworth. And uh, I've been a fan of Cascade Hills. I've been a fan of your pastor for a long time and, uh, and his dad before that. I remember sitting in his office downstairs years ago. I don't even know how long ago it's been, but it was a long time. And uh, sitting there asking him a million questions over and over and over again. And he sat there so patiently for probably two hours just talking to me back 10 years ago after we had started our church and uh, was so gracious. And it was um, a real honor to be able to meet with him. And then now Pastor Brent uh, and his family and Carrie and the kids, just what an honor and a privilege it is to be able to see what God is doing and to be able to see uh, where God is, uh, where he's brought you from, where he's taking you. And sometimes I think that is super important because uh, when you are in the middle of a move of God, sometimes it's very easy uh, to take it for granted because it's hard to see how amazing it is when you're in the middle of it. It's, it's probably like this. When you were, how many of you remember, you can raise your hand in a second, if you remember fireworks when you were a little kid. You remember that? Raise your hand. Uh, some of you have never seen fireworks before, so I am very sad for you. But for those of you that raised your hand and you have seen fireworks, I mean, that's amazing. I remember the first time I saw them and when I was a little kid and they would blow up in the sky and your face, you would either were the kind of person that either loved it or you were terrified, right? But either way, it was amazing. It was awesome from the standpoint of it was just like bigger than life. It was loud. It was bold. It was crazy. And then as time goes on, maybe uh, for me, now I've brought my own kids to go see fireworks and you watch their expressions and how they are and how amazed they are at the whole experience. But for me, it was really no big deal because I have become so familiar with the fireworks. I think a lot of times when you're in a place like Cascade Hills, it's easy to become so familiar with the fireworks that you take for granted what it is that you're a part of. You don't even mean to. You just accidentally do. And it's good to have an outside voice to come in and say what you get to experience week in, week out. It is not normal. It is amazing. God is moving here. People are talking about your church all over the country. You have world-class leaders like God must love you to have brought the Purvis family here for this long. It is amazing uh, to see what it is that God has done. And so um, I love you guys. Super, super grateful to be able to be here. Your best days are ahead. I cannot wait to see what God's going to continue to do at Cascade Hills. But I have got to dive into this message or we are never going to get done. So let me tell you some of the ground rules. Number one, uh, if you want me to preach well and you want it to be good and you also want it to be fast, I love it when you talk back. If you clap, if you say amen, if you respond in some way. If you're quiet, I think you don't understand. So I just start coming up with more illustration after illustration. So it'll take me forever. So this is your choice. You will either be here for the next 30 minutes or you will be here for the next two hours, right? So it is up to you. Four o'clock, even four o'clock was rolling today. So we had some fun at four. I think we can do the same thing at six. But again, it's up to you. I, I will either get you out of here by about 7, 10, or it might be 8.30. It, it just depends. So we'll kind of see how this goes. How many of you know time Time seems to go faster the older you get? If you've noticed that, uh, raise your hand. It's so true. Time flies. I got an email a couple years ago. It was about our 20th, my 20th high school reunion. And I was like, have you ever just gotten news? And it's not even bad news, but you took it as bad news. I got this email and it devastated me for a second. I was like, 20 years? I have been out of high school 20 years. That, that is unbelievable to me. And so I went to a high school in the middle of absolutely nowhere. So I'm searching to see where they're gonna do 
the reunion ad. I'm like, they're going to do it in the middle of a cow field. I know that's what they're going to do. And so I go online and I'm searching like Cherokee High School reunion and all this stuff. And I don't know if you know this, you probably do, but anytime you search for something, you're gonna start getting targeted ads almost immediately. You don't even have to search for stuff now. You have Alexa in your house. You can be talking about biscuits, just in the morning, innocently, talking about biscuits. By 12 p.m., you're gonna open up your phone and there's gonna be a biscuit right there on the front of your phone. It is the craziest thing you have ever seen in your life. Well, I did a search, I was trying to figure out where they were gonna do this reunion, and I started getting all these ads for reunion companies. I didn't even know that that was a thing, a reunion company. And there was this picture, and I have, by the way, I have, you'll, you'll notice this, I do a lot of by the ways because I think of things on the fly. How many of you have ADD? Anybody raise your hand? I have ADD, D, 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 right? So however bad it is for you, it is worse for me. I click on this ad, and when I do, it's like this, not to be mean, but it was kind of a goofy looking guy. It was on purpose, it was an ad. So he was purposely goofy looking, and he was like, he had his hand on this, I don't remember what kind of car it was, but it was amazing. Let's say it's that new Tesla that goes from zero to 60 in like 1.7 seconds and costs 200 something thousand dollars. That is insane to me. But here he was, he has his hand on this car and it says something like, something to the effect of, does your car portray how sophisticated you really are? Reunion rentals. It wasn't really called reunion rentals, but I'm just going to give it a name for now, primarily because even if I knew the name, I don't want you to know it because I don't want you to go to this website. But reunion rentals, and it had this guy, he has his hand on this car. It's not a normal rental type company, though. They personalize the car. So if I'm from Georgia, and I am, they would make sure that the license plate was a Georgia license plate. I'm the pastor of Freedom Church, so they might put a Freedom Church sticker on the back window of the car because their goal is to make it look like it's mine so that when I show up to the reunion, I show up in style and I show up in an impressive fashion. I want to be more sophisticated than, than I really am because as you can tell, I'm a very sophisticated person. But I started scrolling down through the, I don't know why y'all laughed at that, but I started scrolling down through the website and when I did, I found out that you can rent more than cars at reunion rentals. You can rent friends. And if you want to show up, if you want to show up at the reunion, and you, maybe, maybe you got divorced, or maybe you're single, but you don't want people to know, or I don't know what reason it might be, you can rent a friend. You can pick them out. It is a lineup. And you pick them out. And they go with you to the reunion. And you send each other this questionnaire so that you get your story straight about how you met and how long you've been together and all these different things. And I was just amazed that this is a company. It has a CEO. There is a CEO of this so-called reunion rentals, and it is capitalizing on the insecurities of people who want to show up to their reunion and portray to other people something that they are really not. It made me think about how, how many, I'm not gonna ask you, I'm not gonna ask too many questions, but I have Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, all that stuff. I, I don't have a TikTok because I cannot dance. My kids all have TikToks, but they're hilarious, by the way. But I am on those and on Instagram, you know, you can put filters on everything. And so sometimes I'll take a picture, do something, I'll look at them like, oh, I need some. I need to move over a little bit, put some new filters on there. I gotta make myself look a little bit better. I gotta look a little bit younger. I gotta get better lighting. I gotta do this, gotta do that. And I feel so bizarre. I am a 40 year old man and certainly I can learn how to take a picture one time and not have to retake it 12 times because I want it to look better than it actually is. There, I don't know if any of you have ever done this. There are people and they meet online dating, online dating. I've been dating my wife since uh, we were 16 years old. She was 15. I was 16. We've been married a long time. So I can't even imagine dating in this climate. But I imagine because of Instagram with so many filters, I bet two people could show up at a restaurant, have been talking to each other for a long time, and look right at each other in the eyes and not even recognize each other. Because you're going to be like, who are you? Because you do not look like your picture. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed this? And the reality, here's the reason why, right? Let's be honest. Every single one of us. You're in a group picture, and there's eight of you. And the way you determine if the picture was good is how you look in the picture. The other person could have their eyes closed. There could be a parakeet on their head. And you do not care as long as you look good in the picture. Now, 
on the flip side, it's also true. Everybody could look amazing in the picture. And if you don't think that you look amazing, that's a horrible picture. I mean, that's the worst picture that's ever been taken. This is because of the fact that we just have this tendency now to always want to portray that we have our whole act together, that we have our life together, that everything we do is amazing. I don't know if you know this or not, at the mall by my house, there's a mall 15 minutes away, there is a store in the mall and you don't buy anything. There are sets, six or seven sets inside the mall, inside the store, and it is for pictures so that you can take pictures. So I can get on there and it looks like I'm in a jet and it looks legit. Then I could take pictures and be like, I'm on my way to Miami or I'm on my way to Cancun. And that's not true. I'm in the middle of the town center mall in Kennesaw, Georgia. There are all these different sets and all these different things that are going on. And the reason they have it is they're capitalizing on the insecurities of people. People are insecure. I'm insecure. I struggle with insecurity all the time. I struggle with insecurity when I walk on the stage. I struggle with insecurity every single day of my life. And one of the things that I know to be true is that we live in this culture where people tend to find their identity in the home they live in, the car they drive, the person that they're with, the amount of money that they have in their account, their net worth. They figure out ways to make themselves look better when they compare themselves with other people. They only compare themselves with people to whom they compare favorably. It's what we do. It's not a new problem. This has been a problem for, from a, the very beginning of time. You hear some people say sometimes, you hear them be like, the world has just gone crazy. The world's gone crazy. It's worse now than it's ever been. I don't think that it's worse now than it's ever been. I just think now we hear about it more than we've ever heard about it before. And you go all the way back to the days when Jesus was walking around on this earth in bodily form. And you had people dealing with insecurity, you had people dealing with all kind of past issues, people dealing with relationship issues, people dealing with all kind of stuff. There's a guy in the Bible by the name of John. I wanna read some of what it is that he wrote. I want you to notice something, and then I'm gonna ask a question and then we'll really dive into this message. John chapter 13, verse 23. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him, talking about Jesus. John chapter 19, verse 26. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. John chapter 20, verse 2. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. John chapter 21, verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when you read this, you might be like, whoever wrote that, John must be the nicest, most secure individual on the planet because he's writing about somebody, one of the followers of Jesus, that Jesus just must have really had a connection with. One of the disciples that Jesus loved is so nice for John to acknowledge that. But if you dive deeper into John, you find out that that really wasn't the case at all. Who wrote, by the way, I'm going to ask you who wrote the book of John. You're going to say John. This is an open book test. I'm just going to give you the answer on the front end. And so when I ask you, you're going to repeat it back. You're going to say John. Who wrote the book of John? John. You're the smartest church ever, Cascade Hills. John wrote the book of John. So who was he writing about whenever he said four times in a row, the disciple that Jesus loved? John wrote it about John. John wrote that about himself. It's as if I got to write a book in the Bible. I've been petitioning Jesus, asking him to see if I could get my book put into the Bible. So far, it has been a no. But it would be as if there was a book of the Bible called the book of J.R. And I wrote in it and said, the pastor whom Jesus loved the most. The pastor that Jesus thought was the most amazing, or just the one that Jesus thought was the most awesome. It sounds so weird if I wrote that about myself. It would almost sound strange. You gotta realize though who John was. John wrote five books of the Bible. I just told you he wrote the book of John. Second book that he wrote, you know what it was called? First John. He wrote another book of the Bible. You know what it was called? 
Second John. He wrote another book of the Bible. You know what it was called? Third John. Then he wrote another one. It was called Revelation. He wanted to name it Fourth John, and Jesus wouldn't let him. Here was a guy by the name of John, and he's writing about himself, that he was the one that Jesus loved. Was he overcompensating? Was he competing with one of the other disciples? Was he trying to prove a point? Or was John just arrogant? I don't think any of those were true. I think something happened in John's life where John got to the point in time where John realized that the most important thing about himself was the fact that he was loved by Jesus. Matter of fact, he never says, and John, the one that Jesus loved. He doesn't even mention his own name. Why did he not mention his own name? I think the, he got to the point where he realized the fact that he was loved by Jesus was more important to his identity even than his own name. The thing that set John apart in John's mind was the fact that he was loved by the Lord. What I want for every single person that is in this room, every single person that is watching online, I want every single one of us to get to the place where we can say, just like John did, that we are the one that Jesus loved. Because here's what John had to do in order to do that. John didn't see himself according to his failures. And that's not just some little sentence we can pass by. Because if you're like me, I oftentimes see myself according to the things that I've done wrong. Sometimes I look in the mirror. Have you ever looked in the mirror and you're like, I do not like what I see. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about you look in the mirror and you're like, I am an idiot sometimes. My son plays baseball. He's playing baseball right now. And there are times when he is, he's 12, and as he was uh, growing up, getting to this point where he's 12, I would go watch baseball games when he is 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 years old. It does not, it is coach pitch when you are 7 years old and 8 years old. It, the game is 24 to 21. It is not real baseball. And I am in that dugout losing my mind. If I think that umpire made a bad call, I am letting that umpire know that he made a bad call. I am letting him know that he is a horrible person. I've done it multiple times. And I've had at the end of games sometimes those umpires come up to me and say, hey, Pastor JR, I've never had my pastor yell at me before on the field. And I'm like, oh, I am loved by God, but I am his stupid son. <laughs> I live north of Atlanta. This is just like there is south of Atlanta. You, we have traffic. I hate traffic. I can be driving down the road, singing a worship song at the top of my lungs, praying about coming to Cascade Hills Church. Let somebody pull in front of me. In 3.2 milliseconds, I can go from praising the Lord to using multiple Christian cuss words back to back. <laughs> on the way to church, with a Freedom Church sticker on the back of the car that just cut me off. There have been times where I have honked my horn at the person that cut me off because I didn't see the Freedom Church sticker and I had to pull up next to him and wave and act like I was just trying to say hi. <laughs> and then I get ready to walk on a stage. It happened tonight. I get ready to walk on the stage and hear the thoughts I have to fight every single time. You're not worthy to do this. What makes you think that anybody cares what you have to say? Why in the world would God use somebody like you? over and over and over again. And if I have a bad day or if I didn't read my Bible or if I respond the wrong way or if I get in an argument with my wife or if I lose my temper with my kids or if I'm just a moron when I'm driving down the road, there used to be a lot of years and a lot of time where I felt almost as if in that moment, God certainly loved me, but it was I felt as if it was because he was contractually obligated to do so. And certainly he didn't like me in that moment. I saw myself according to my failures. Maybe, maybe you do the same thing. Maybe you see yourself not according to your failures. Maybe you see yourself according to maybe even your accomplishments. Maybe you feel as if you have to perform in order to get God's approval. 
you feel as if there's this, it's, you, don't, you would never say this out loud, but going to church and reading the Bible and praying and giving and being kind and doing all that, it's almost like it's a chore chart. And as long as you mark the things off your chore chart, God loves you and he is happy with you and he is pleased with you and he will bless you. And your whole life, your whole relationship with God is contingent on what you can do for God. Let me promise you something and I'll get to this at the end, how we rectify it. But if that's how you view God, you have embraced religion, but not Jesus. I lived a lot of years of my life thinking that I had to earn the approval of God. I lived a lot of years of my life thinking that I had to do whatever I could do to get in and stay in God, God's good graces. That he would love me more if I did this and if I did this and if I did that and if I certainly did not do a list of other things. And if I was able to fulfill my end of the bargain, God would love me and God would be pleased with me. But for John, John got past that. John no longer saw himself according to his accomplishments. John no longer saw himself according to his failures. John saw himself based on what God had said about him and the love that God had for him. For John, his identity and his security and who he was as a person was not contingent on what he did or what he didn't do. It wasn't contingent on what he brought to the table. It wasn't contingent on what his parents said, what his teacher said, what his boss said, what his kids said. It wasn't even contingent on what he said. Who he was as a person was contingent on the fact that he knew that he was loved by God. He was the one that Jesus loved. I want you to know today, I wish I could spend more time. I wish I could go around the room. I can't. I probably actually could because there's not another service coming behind this one, but it would take forever. I wish I could go to every single person that's here one by one and put my hands on your shoulders and say, you are not defined by your past. You are the one that Jesus loves. If you are a follower of Jesus in this room, you have been adopted into God's family. You are a son or a daughter of the king. God loves you and he likes you and he's never going to change his mind about you. I wish I could just go around the room and let every single person know that because there's so many of us, so many times where we are paralyzed in the present or we think that we forfeited our future because of something that happened in the past. Have you ever done something so wrong, you ask God to forgive you multiple times? Where you're like, Lord, I know that I asked you to forgive me about this yesterday or for this yesterday, but I just wanna bring it back up again. Do you know that if you're a follower of Jesus and you ask him to forgive you of something the second time, he says back to you, I have no clue what you're even talking about. God doesn't hold stuff against you. He doesn't, some of us, we feel as if when we say yes to Jesus, Jesus says yes back, but it's in a probationary kind of way. If you can continue staying on the right track, I will continue letting you into heaven. If you can continue following the rules, then I will continue to love you with everything I've got. If that's the way that you feel about God, number one, welcome to the club. That's the way I felt about God for many years of my life. But two, sadly, if that's the way you feel about God, that is the opposite of how God actually feels about you. He is head over heels in love with you. If you are a follower of his, he is head over heels in love with every single person that is in this room. Here's what you need to know. The cure for your insecurity, the cure for these feelings of inferiority, the cure for being miserable as a follower of Jesus, the cure for feeling as if you've got to fulfill a chore chart or you've got to do this list of things, the cure for your insecurity, all the things that I just mentioned, is knowing your true identity. You really are the one that Jesus loves. Not just John, not just JR, but you. Matter of fact, I want you to do this. This is gonna sound kind of strange and we'll get into the rest of this message in a minute. I'm actually getting pretty close to done. Y'all must be listening really, really well. That being said, 
Everybody here, if you are social media savvy, you probably have a picture of yourself on your phone right now. If you are quick with your phone and your social media capabilities, what I would love for you to do is to post that picture. If you have Instagram, post it on Instagram. And all I want you to say is just say, the one that Jesus loves, and then put hashtag, which there's gonna be like, what's the hashtag? A hashtag is the symbol formerly known as the pound sign, right? And you put the pound sign, Cascade Hills Church, no spaces, just all one big long word. And you say, why in the world would I do that? And by the way, if you're not social media savvy, but you have social media and maybe you don't have a picture on your phone, I want you to take a selfie at some point tonight and I want you to post it. Even if you don't have Instagram, maybe, maybe you're like, I got an AOL account and I got the MySpace. Uh, if that's you, then you can post it on the, the MySpace as well. Put it on whatever it is you got. You say, why would you do it? Number one, I want you to take the step of faith that is required. I want you to take one little step towards knowing and believing that you are actually loved by God. Number two, I want it to come up in your memories feed every single year for the rest of your life so that you see it and you're reminded of it because I'm willing to bet that God is sovereign enough that he knows one year from tonight you're going to need to see that message. Three, I want the people that follow you or the people that are just kind of tracking with you on social media, I want them to be intrigued and I want them to know that God is not a God of condemnation. He really is a God of love. And I want, him to be able to, I want them to be able to see it and to be encouraged by it, especially in a culture where we live in where we are bombarded by bad news all the time. So again, take the selfie if you don't have one on there. If you do, you don't even have to take one. You can just post the best picture of yourself that you got, 37 filters that are already on it. Do whatever it is you need to do and just put the one that Jesus loves, hashtag Cascade Hills Church. And tonight when I'm at the hotel, I'm gonna go in and like every single one of those comments because you really are the one that Jesus loves. You are the one that Jesus loves. You in spite of all the things that you've done, in spite of all the things that you've said, in spite of all the things that you've thought, you are the one that Jesus loves. Matter of fact, I want you to just say it out loud. Say, I am the one that Jesus loves. You ready? I am the one that Jesus loves. I need you to know the reason this is so important. This is not just one of those lovey-dovey messages. People ask me all the time, Pastor, what do I need to do to love God more? Can I tell you the secret to loving God more? It's not going to church, although that's a good thing to do. It's not reading your Bible, although you totally should. It's not praying, although of course you need to pray. It's not giving, although of course you need to do that. It's not those things. The way that you begin to love God more is to dive deeper into how much it is that God loves you. When you know how much God loves you, I, I shouldn't say when you know how much he loves you because it's impossible for you to know how much he loves you, but as you begin to become increasingly aware of how much it is that God loves you, all of a sudden you'll know it's working when your got-tos become get-tos. When you start thinking, I don't gotta go to church on a Saturday night, I get to go to church on a Saturday night. I don't gotta read my Bible, I get to read my Bible. I don't gotta pray in order for God to love me. God loves me, so therefore I pray. I don't gotta give to get into God's good graces. God thinks I'm awesome already, so of course I'm going to give. It changes everything about you. You can't even love people well until you know how much it is that God loves you. You can't love people and you can't love yourself. One of the reasons people aren't good at loving people is because we do love people the way that we love ourselves. And in this culture, we don't love ourselves. We think that we do. The problem is we come across as if we're overly in love with ourselves, but it's because we're masking so much insecurity, we're overcompensating for it. So what I want you to know, you are loved by God. I feel like I'm repeating myself over and over and over again, but I told you I'm going to. You are the one that Jesus loves. God likes you and he loves you and he's never gonna turn his back on you and he goes before you, he comes behind you, he walks beside you and he guides your steps. He is never gonna change his mind. Listen, there is, this is, this is a game changer. There is nothing you could ever do to make God love you more. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, I should put that in there. If you are a follower of Jesus, there is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. Here's the flip side of that. If you're a follower of Jesus, there's nothing you could ever do to cause God to love you any less. And when you start to realize that, here's what it does. Man, God is awesome. I really do love him now. I love him more today than I did yesterday because I'm starting to become increasingly aware of how much it is that God loves me. Whenever my got to's and they, or my get to's start turning back into got to's, you know what I realize? It's not because I'm not reading my Bible enough. It's not because I'm not praying enough. It's not because I'm not doing all the things enough. It's because I've forgotten how much it is that God loves me. Because when I'm aware of how much it is that God loves me, my got to's turn to get to's and it changes everything about the trajectory of my life. Christianity is not about what you can do for God. Christianity is about what God has already done for you. We don't earn our way to God. If we could earn our way to God, then God wasted his time when he sent his son to live and to die and to be buried and to be risen from the dead. Why send Jesus if we can be good enough to get to heaven? That would have been irresponsible of God. God is not irresponsible. He is holy and he is pure and he is righteous. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end and the first and the last. It is at the feet of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he alone is Lord. He is God and he is good. He enables us to love him because he first loved us. That's what it means in one of John's books, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now watch this. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So when you hear about the love of God, there's a couple things that are true about that. Number one, God's love is all-encompassing. That means he loves every part of you. If you're a follower of Jesus, he loves you on the good days. He loves you on the bad days. He loves you in spite of how it is that, or what it is that you have a tendency and a propensity to do. God loves you. It is all encompassing. Not only is it all encompassing, but God's love is also sacrificial. The reason I say it's sacrificial is because it's not selfish. It's caring more, it's not, it's getting to the point where God was willing to do for us what we were unwilling to do for ourselves and what it is that we were incapable of doing for ourselves. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's the J.R. Lee translation. Even when we were dumb, making horrible decisions, running from God, Jesus died for us. He loved us enough to come to this earth and have nails driven through his wrist and through his feet, a crown of thorns placed down on his head, a sword driven through his side, beat within an inch of his life with a whip called a cat of nine tails. He could have snapped his fingers and said, forget this man, save yourselves. He could have snapped his fingers and legions, thousands and thousands of angels would have come and wiped out everybody standing around that's what I would have done if I was Jesus I would have been a horrible Jesus sacrificial love he gave himself so that he could have a relationship with you because God's love is sacrificial but God's love is also unconditional I said this a moment ago I want to say it again because this sentence these two sentences changed my life already as a follower of Jesus as a pastor, these sentences changed my life. There is nothing I can do to make God love me more. I remember when we had, we started our church. I remember when we had five people. It was only 14 years ago we had five people. Five. I was one. Married to one. My kid was one. And two other people. I remember it. I remember thinking if we ever get to like, hundred people, God's going to love me so much. It's such a stupid way to think. 
But we do this stuff all the time. Then we got there, it's like, if we ever get to 500 people, God's gonna love me. God's gonna be so proud of me. If we ever get to 1,000 people. You know what I realized? God loves me just as much, he loved me just as much back then as he does right now. When I'm yelling at the umpire, I don't do that that much anymore. It's different, different level baseball now. I will certainly still yell at a car and the people inside of it. And I will surprise myself with how bad the thoughts get. I have in seconds figured out how to kill and dispose of bodies. I have, you can judge me if you want, God still loves me. Cause I'm the one that Jesus loves. You might not, but Jesus does, that's good enough for me. It set me free to be a better pastor. I used to be fearful that the mess, what if the message doesn't connect? What if it's not good? I realized God loves me just as much on the days that I feel like the message didn't work as he does on the days where I feel like everything went perfectly. It helped me to put my head on the pillow and sleep at night. Because I realized it's not what I do for God. It's what God did for me. Thinking that you can please God based on what you do for him is religion. Realizing that it's what God did for you is what Christianity is all about. And sir, ma'am, I really do wish I could come and just let you know you're the one that Jesus loves. I don't care about your past. I don't care what you've been told. I don't care what you've done. You are the one. If you're a follower of his, you're the one that Jesus loves. And before you leave tonight, if you're already a follower of Jesus, I just want you to walk out with a greater awareness of that, even if it's like this much more. But I know there's a bunch of people in this room, you're not yet a follower of Jesus. I need you to know that it's possible you walked into this room far from God, but you can walk out of this room having experienced life in Christ. You say, how, how would I do that? The reason it can happen so fast is because it's not contingent on you. It's contingent on what Jesus has already done for you. He just wants you to acknowledge that and accept that and say, like he did to me, April the 11th of 1996, you've got to admit, big boy, that there's nothing you can do to get to God. There's nothing you can do to have your sin forgiven based on your goodness or your ability to do good or try hard. What Jesus wanted from me and what it is that he wants from you is the ability to just say, God, you have to do the work. You lived for me through the person of your son, Jesus. You died on the cross so that my sin could be forgiven. You took my place on the cross. I should have been there. You were innocent. I was guilty. You died on the cross so that I could be forgiven. Lord, I confess that. Lord, they buried you in a tomb and then three days later, you came out of that tomb conquering death, hell, and the grave, making it possible for me to experience a brand new life. And so Lord, today I surrender, I surrender to you. And I'm asking you to step into my life and I'm asking you to save me. This is not about what I can do for God. This is about what God has done for me. And so today I say yes to you. If you're at a point in your life right now where you're ready to say yes to Jesus, don't wait. Let's make it happen tonight. God brought you here for this very purpose. Matter of fact, if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, just in your mind, just pray for those that need to say yes to Jesus right here, right now. This is a praying church. So right now in your own mind, just pray for those that need to say yes to him. Would y'all do me a favor? Just everybody stand to your feet all over the room. I'm gonna do this invitation pretty quickly. But if you're in this room right now with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, you want your sin to be forgiven, you want your life to be changed, you want heaven to be your home, the best way you know how you're ready to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and as a result, you know it says in God's word that you will be saved, changed, and forgiven. That's the opportunity that you have right here, right now, is to have your sin forgiven by the person of Jesus Christ. So right where you stand,
If you're ready to say yes to Jesus, just pray this prayer with me as I pray it out loud. Say, Lord, the best way I know how, I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus. The best way I know how, I'm saying yes to you. Lord, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And as a result, I'm asking tonight that you would do what you said you would do, that you would save me, change me, forgive me, and make all things new right here, right now. Thank you so much for joining us today. If this ministry or this message has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. Now, if you'd like to financially support this ministry as it continues to spread the word of Jesus Christ around the globe, you can go to our website, CascadeHills.com, or download our free mobile app and click on the Give button. We invite you to check out some of our other messages or tune in live every weekend, Saturdays at 4 or 6 p.m. or Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.